Good afternoon. My name is Pastor Jeremy Shines, and this is I Am Loved Church. Let's pray. Father, there's a message here that you want spoken, and I just pray you help me speak it. You open our ears, our eyes, you open our hearts and our spirits to your word. Father, you would convict us to cut off that flesh inside of us. Conviction cuts the flesh, Lord, so cut us, cut us clean, cut us deep, and teach us who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, there's so many problems in the world, isn't there? And the problem is us, right, people? <laughs> there's so many problems in the world. But you know what? God is on the throne. He's on the throne. And uh, as long as he's on the throne, he's going to deal with each person. And I didn't believe that before, but now I'm walking into that and I'm like, wow, you really are dealing with it. I'm realizing that because he's dealing with me. And when I look back before I was saved, he was, he's been dealing with me. He's dealing with every single one of us. So yes, the world may not be fair as far as us being fair to each other, but God is. And God is going to deal with each person. Each of us has a conscience that God gave us. We know when we did good and we know when we did bad. We already know. That's what the scriptures say. Everybody knows that God exists. All they're doing is denying it, suppressing it, pretending that he doesn't. Looking for reasons why he doesn't, but in reality, their conscience is screaming out that he exists and that he's angry with him. Now, how do you know that God is angry with you? Did you know that your anger is actually triggering God's anger? Oftentimes, I would say 90 plus percent of the time, right? Because there's that little portion that you could be angry because God is angry at certain situations. Like most people have an anger for people in sin. Okay. And it's a righteous anger. But most of the other times, I would say 90%, I don't know the perfect math, but about 90%, I think that the, op that, that the fact that we are angry is God's wrath revealed from heaven upon earth. Read Romans chapter one and saying, I'm angry with you. So when you see people marching and protesting and all that stuff, right? It could be that God is angry about what happened and it's showing up through the people. But most of the time I have found when I'm angry, it's usually because God's angry with me. That is the wrath of God revealed. That's how God punishes us. And that's our message. How does God punish human beings? Every time you see an angry person, that is God's wrath and punishment upon that person. Say it one more time. Every time you see somebody who's angry, it's usually probably not a righteous anger. It's usually God's wrath upon them. That's how I know God's angry with me, is when I get angry, I know God is angry with me. Because think about what, how they describe hell. Hell is a place with weeping and gnashing of teeth. Doesn't being angry sound like weeping and gnashing of teeth? Yeah! Isn't that kind of like a fire? Yeah! Like a blazing heat? But here's the cool part about it. Because God is so kind, the fire of hell is designed to purify us from sin. So your anger, for example, is actually designed to purify you from the sin that you sinned. <laughs> so when we fall into sin, or when we sin, we get angry. Let me say it one more time. When we sin, when you and I sin, when people sin, we get angry. Anger is the sign that we have sinned. Say it one more time. Anger is the sign that you have sinned. Anger is the sign that I have sinned. Anger is the sign that they are in sin, that they have sinned. And the only way that that anger is going to go away is if it burns itself out. I've gotten so mad 
for a long duration or period of time, it eventually burned itself off of me. That's how we get purified. <laughs> That's how, the, that's how the sin gets dealt with, so to speak. Or may I say, that's how we should realize when we need to repent and have God purify us with the blood of Jesus. Because people who don't repent while they're burning in their anger about the sin that they committed in denial, blaming everybody for it, their anger, right? Right? Only Jesus can purify, only his blood from the cross can wash that anger off, can satisfy that wrath of God, which is their anger. So when God eternally judges somebody, he's saying, you're going to stay like that forever. You're going to stay angry forever. So you're just going to be angry that you're angry that you're angry that you're angry. I've, I've lived in that. Until I finally went, Lord, forgive me. And then he washed that anger off of me, purified me. That's how God deals with us. So when you see people in sin, that is their punishment. The fact that they're angry. They're angry about the way the world is. They're angry about... The sin that they committed, but instead of co confessing that, they're blaming other people, trying to justify themselves through sacrificing that person or, or this or that or look for some justification outside of Christ and repenting of their sin or forgiving for people who sinned against them. I get You get angry when someone sins against you. I do. Rightfully so. That's righteous anger. But God says, I am the avenger. So forgive that person so I can wash you of what they done to you so you don't have to remain angry, okay? Because revenge is, should not come from our hands. It should come from the Lord. When you and I sin, the other person knows what they did was wrong because they have a God-given conscience, okay? When we sin, we get angry. Right? So with that being said, when people sin against us, forgive them so you don't have to burn in anger towards them forever and ever and ever. <laughs> and when you sin against people, repent. And if they don't forgive you, they're going to be burning in anger towards you forever and ever and ever until they forgive you. And that is the punishment. Jesus gave Judas Iscariot the money bag to hold on to. He put his sin in his face. And this doesn't make sense to us because most of the time we go, if you, if you want to stay free from sin, then stay away from the sin. But God does the opposite. He puts you in front of the sin. This is God's wisdom. I don't understand it, right? But it's kind of cool. He puts the sin in front of you. I said to God, I said, God, deliver me from porn. And you know what? I fell into porn. I was like porn binging, long story short. And I was like, I, I thought I, I didn't pray this. And he's like, yes, you did. You see, back in the Old Testament, they were tired of eating manna from heaven. And so they complained to God and they said, God, give us something else to eat. We don't want to eat this manna anymore. And God's like, since you guys keep complaining, I'm going to have you eat quail. And so when quail came down from the heavens, they were like, yes, finally, some meat. <laughs> and God says, I'm going to give you so much quail, it's going to come out of your nose. And you're going to hate, you're going to hate the fact that you even asked me by complaining about this quail stuff. And so God did the same to me. He's like, I'm going to let you binge porn, Jeremy. I'm going to let you binge porn. And... I prayed that God would deliver me from porn, right? I was like, God, deliver me, deliver me. I was like complaining, right? And then he's like, okay. And he put the porn in my face. And every single chance I got, I benched it. And you know what I did, of course, right? And then I, and I got so disgusted with it. I got so frustrated. I, 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 I couldn't even watch. I couldn't even look at another woman. 
I couldn't even look at it anymore. I was like, I was so, like it wasn't doing anything anymore. That's happened when I've gotten drunk before. I drink so much that I eventually I couldn't, I didn't want to drink anymore. And that's God's wisdom there. You're like, that doesn't sound biblical. Actually it is. There was a man who was uh, committing adultery with his father's wife. It was actually his stepmother. And the apostle Paul says, give this man over to Satan. In other words, give this man over to his sinful desire that he may be pur purged. You see, in Romans, it says that God gives us over to our sinful desires as our punishment. Your sinful desire is your punishment. It's my punishment. That is the wrath of God revealed. He gives you over to the desires of your heart. That's your punishment. So when, I, when God gave me over, for example, to pornography, literally it binged it, and I got so sick of it. Just like Judas Iscariot, God, Jesus said, you can go ahead, sell me out for silver coins. And he did. The thing that he desired became the thing that he loathed because he took the same money that he betrayed Jesus with. He shows up later and he throws it in the, in the, in the Pharisee's face. He loathed the very thing that he desired. You see, the very sin that you desire, eventually you will loathe. That's the wisdom of God. He says, hand, hand that man over to Satan so for his punishment, for his correction. Satan, God keeps Satan on a leash to punish us when we sin. So what, what actually delivered me from porn was porn. Now when I see a woman, I, I, I don't even want to see it. I, I don't even want to see it. Like I loathe it now. I'm like, what? there's nothing there. It's emptiness. Now I still love my wife, <laughs> but, but I, I, don't, I, I just can't stand. God will use your sin to deliver you from your sin. What? <laughs> that's wise man <laughs> Judas Iscariot couldn't stand he, he couldn't stand the fact that he, he had betrayed the son of God he still had an opportunity to repent but he chose not to sad to say but you and I have the opportunity to repent your sin is your punishment if you're addicted to money that's your punishment if you're addicted to power, that's your punishment. If you're addicted to porn, that's your punishment. If you're addicted to alcohol, that's your punishment. Whatever you're addicted to, that is your punishment. So when we look at the world and we see all these people going after all these things, right? Sex, drugs, alcohol, fame, so on and so forth, fill in the blank. That is their punishment. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven on earth. They're already in their punishment. Now the question is, they still have a chance to repent, to give those things back to the world or back to the devil, to renounce those things and accept Christ, come to Christ or come back to Christ. Because one day there's gonna be an eternal decision made and go, okay, now you can have that forever. And if we look at Judas Iscariot, in the end, he, the thing that he desired became the thing that he loathed, that he hated. That the thing, that the sin in the world will eventually be your demise. The thing that you want one day, oh God, I just want sin, I want sin, I want sin. God's finally going to slam the gauntlet down and say, no, you can have it. Actually, that's what he's doing now. You can have it. You can have it. Because it's never going to satisfy you. That's how God punishes us. I remember back in the day, I was always wanting to be in a relationship with some girl, right? And so I went around dating, 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 and, and even worshiping some girls, right? And long story short, 
even being in those relationships, I began to loathe those women. Because I realized that they can't satisfy me the way God can satisfy me. Or porn, or alcohol, or greed, or fame, or fill in the blank, or religion. <laughs> Nothing can satisfy the human heart. It's a deep, empty pit that never ends. And the only one who can satisfy our longing to be satisfied and give us peace is God. And when we're trying to look for it in the world or look for it in other people other than Jesus, you will always be left empty. So when we run after sin, we're running into punishment. Or may I say, we're running into hell. Isn't that crazy? Let me say that one more time. When people run after sin, whether drugs or alcohol or money as their top joy in life, whatever you run after, that is your punishment. Read Romans chapter one. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven. God gave them over to their debased minds. To their debased means like degenerated or dehydrated, if I could say. <laughs> Low thinking, right? Basically like eating vomit on a plate. No one would do that. But that's their thinking. Their thinking is like eating vomit on a plate. God gave them over to their low thinking. I know. I've lived it. I've been there. My thinking was depraved. My thinking was dark. My thinking was unsatisfied. Had no peace of mind. And God gave me over to my degenerate mind as a form of punishment. Nebuchadnezzar is another example. He was a he was a ruler, as a king of the entire world at the time that he lived, in the days of Daniel. And he would not acknowledge, he would only, from time to time, would acknowledge that God is king of heaven. You know what I'm saying? And then he eventually got away from acknowledging God as the king of heaven through the prophet Daniel in his day, that he threw in the lion's den and did all other stuff, mean things to him. And if I was like, I don't care, I... I I'm God, as, as, as Nebuchadnezzar said. I am God. I am worthy to be worshipped. That's what Nebuchadnezzar said, not me. <laughs> and what God did is God gave him a mind like ca a cow. He gave him a mind of a cow. And so he, he was this king who was robed in majesty in his day. Can you imagine the president of our day grazing grass like a cow? <laughs> There's this funny meme about Nebuchadnezzar eating grass, and he said, and the title of it says Nebuchadnezzar enjoying his free will. Our free will is like us eating vomit on a plate, or us grazing the things of the world, or, or falling into porn, for example, or falling into uh, greed or covetousness and all that stuff. That's a degenerate mind, degenerated, unhydrated mind. That is the punishment of God. So God doesn't have to punish us necessarily because the sin is the punishment. And so it's interesting that we think that we have to punish people on top of the sin. Now, I'm not saying that shouldn't be some people in jail, <laughs> right, who committed some really severe, heinous crimes, right? What I am saying, as far as the church is concerned, that when we sin, it's weighing upon our conscience. It's weighing upon our souls, the guilt, the shame. And what Jesus does is he provides us a way out of the guilt and shame. That's what him dying on the cross is. It, his, his dying on a cross, it represents a door. Back in the Jewish days, what they did was in the day of uh, the Passover, they took a lamb and they marked the sides of the doorpost, the top of the doorpost as a sign, right? And I think on the door itself. 
as a sign of Christ's death, as a door, as a way out of the punishment that's coming upon the world. Did you know God is punishing the world every day? For example, let's just say this is, this is the will of God within this screen that you can see me in, right? This is the will of God. And if I step out of the the will of God, I step into, I step into punishment. If I sin against God, which is to step outside of this where you can see me, I am being punished for that sin. When we sin against God, that is God's wrath. That's God's punishment. And what Jesus did is he provided a way out of God's punishment. Punishment is befalling from heaven upon earth every single day. To those who believe if they sin, and obviously those who are living in sin. We as Christians don't have to condemn people because they're already condemned. Now the difference is they have a chance to repent before they're eternally staying in that condition. All we have to do is be nice and gracious and merciful. That's it. Because they're already feeling judged for their sin. They're already feeling guilty for their trespasses. They're all, it's already on their shoulders. The shame, the guilt. I know, because I lived it. So when Paul says, he says, hand this, this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, I think. Hand this man over to the devil. That, that his sin could be like the prodigal son. That his sin, which he thought could set him free, is his condemnation, is his punishment. And the story of the prodigal son is when the son finally realizes, I've sinned against God and my father, right? And he comes back. Or may I say, comes to Christ. And then he's forgiven. God has already forgiven everybody. He's already forgiven the world. But the difference is that the world doesn't want to be forgiven. So they're still outside. In the wrath of God. You can see it when, when lives are destroyed around us. When things happen around us. You can see the wrath of God all over the place. And all they have to do is repent, acknowledge Christ as Savior, and they'll be shown mercy. They'll be shown forgiveness. They will be healed. All they have to do is acknowledge what they did is wrong. What they're doing is a, is a sin against God. That's it. And once they do that, they'll be healed. They'll be forgiven. They'll be given new life, eternal life. They'll walk in freedom and God's grace. Amen. But like I said, we still struggle with sin. But God, guess what? When we sin, we know it. <laughs> and we need to repent. Amen? God is calling us to repentance. Those in the church and obviously those outside the church. So let's repent when the Holy Spirit brings up trespasses against God that we've committed. Let us get set free. His grace is sufficient. His grace covered all debt and trespasses for those who want to repent, for those who want to acknowledge what they did was wrong, say, God, Jesus, forgive me. And he forgives. But one day, one day, the opportunity of God's forgiveness will finally shut. The door is going to shut. There's not going to be any more forgiveness anymore. They're going to be stuck in that state and that condition for the rest of their life. We as Christians don't need to judge them. They're already judged. And we don't really need to judge each other. Because when we sin, God's wrath, as soon as I sin, <laughs> boom, I get hit with God's wrath. <laughs> I get angry. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I repent, and then I'm like, not angry anymore. I'm good. <laughs> so if you're, hey, whatever you're angry about, okay? Repent. And when you look at the unsaved world, just be nice to them. You don't have to expose their sin. You just have to say, you know, Jesus Jesus can forgive you. I don't know what your sin is. Even if you do know what their sin is, you, 
I wouldn't say it. <laughs> just say, you know, if you see their sin, just be like, oh, I struggled with that. If you genuinely actually struggled with that. And they'll already feel that, right? So if they're struggling with porn, you could be like, yeah, I remember when I struggled with porn. Because if you tell them you struggle with porn and you need to repent, they're not going to repent. <laughs> but if you say, you know, I used to struggle with porn or I struggle with porn, they'll get convicted. They'll be like, ugh. How'd you know that? I do that, right? Be merciful. Be gracious to them. If, so, if grace and mercy could save you and me, it could save them. They're already judged. You don't need to add to that. Like the world. The world adds to it. You've sinned. Now we're going to punish you on top of that. Like, what? <laughs> They're already punished. Even as Christians, when we sin, God, boom. I know it. I'm like, yeah, dang. <laughs> and so whew. just be nice be merciful you know and, uh, and, and and let that draw them to Christ because they already know what it's like to be judged they're already feeling the wrath of God the weightiness on their shoulders they're feeling the shame the guilt they walk around with it day and night they sleep with it they dream about it all of it <laughs> right and, and one day you show up and you're just being nice to them. They're like, that, that, the Bible says being, being merciful. Old Testament and new is like being kind to someone who's in sin. It's like pouring hot lava on them. Okay, let's go. That's what it's like in the day of judgment. The day of judgment, the, the kindness of God is so kind, it's going to burn them. You ever, you ever heard that? Kill them with kindness? Well, don't kill him with fake kindness. Kill him with the, the spirit of grace. Amen. Like God wash you, heal you. Because guess what? Because that's burning them. They're like, why are you so nice? Oh, stop it. I've had, I've had people do that. You're killing me with your kindness. I've actually had that. It's not my kindness. It's his kindness flowing through me to you. Amen. And that usually, that draws us to repentance. I remember not... Wanting to be repent, not wanting to repent, and then God was just being kind to me, and it drew me into repentance. And so if it works with us, it can work with them around us. Just be nice to them, because they already know, they already feel the weight, they are, our conscience is already seared with guilt, they already feel shame. And when you're being kind to them, they're like, it draws them to Jesus, so that they too may be forgiven, amen? <laughs> That's all I got for you. That's the message of how God punishes us. The sin is its own punishment. But the cool thing is that grace, there's always grace until one day there's not, until the door shuts, right? But for now, great, the door of grace is open for anyone, right? And we're, our job as Christians are not to condemn people. They're already condemned. They're already judged. They already know what they did is wrong. They already know what they're doing is wrong, whether they deny it. Whether they have all these reasons or excuses, they already know, just like you and I knew, okay? All you guys have to do, all I have to do is just be merciful and kind. And if you're angry, that means you did something wrong. That means you're not forgiving somebody who wronged you or you sinned against God. So, <laughs> so repent or forgive, amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this word. Bless this word. Bless them. Forgive us. Forgive them. Teach us. Teach them. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, amen, and God bless.